Welcome, Dr. Shagamano. Hey, Jim, how are you? Uh, well, very well, thank you. Yeah. We should be ready to start here in just a few minutes. So Colin, our other two, pan our three panelists are here, which is uh, Dr. Thomas Title Answer, uh, Colleen McMahon and De uh, Dr. Deborah, Dr. Colleen McMahon and Dr. Deborah Lehman. If you want to post those three, so just the panelists know you three will be uh, posted, uh, pinned, I should say, uh, on top. So that way when you're, you're always visible. So when you start talking, another one starts talking, that all the faces don't switch around. So um, you'll be pinned to the uh, top bar so everyone can can see you folks. So um, we'll just give it one more minute. Uh, we'll just one minute pass and then we'll get started with our uh, questions. All three should be pinned. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, this is an exciting joint venture we're doing here. We have uh, every year uh, here at LCC, we do a, a speaker series and have uh, individuals from the community uh, come to speak at Lorain County Community College. And this year we partnered up with uh, SciKai, which is the Honor Society at uh, Cleveland State uh, University. Uh, in our society in psychology at Cleveland State University. And so we have this wonderful joint session. And so we are joined by um, three uh, distinguished panelists from Cleveland State and University Hospital. And we will introduce those folks to you in just, just a minute. Um, we've uh, had discussion between uh, Psi Beta and Psi Chi about some questions that we would like to ask. And so um, members of Psi Chi and Psi Beta uh, and others will be asking those those questions. So um, we'll just we'll jump right into it. Uh, first, um, I'd like to introduce introduce Abby Sears. Uh, she is an officer at uh, here at Psi Beta, and she is going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Thomas Scheidelmantel. And then uh, once she is done, then uh, if the um, two members from Psi Chi can introduce our other panelists, that would be great. So Abby, go ahead. Okay. Um, Dr. Time Thomas Scheidemantel, MD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Scheidemantel's clinical practice focuses on adults who have an intellectual or developmental disability, as well as co-occurring psychiatric or mental health concerns. Dr. Scheidemantel also serves as a consulting psychiatrist to the Warrensville Developmental Center, an Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities operated residential facility in Northeast Ohio. Um, Dr. Scheidemantel completed his undergraduate training at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio, and completed his undergraduate medical training at the Northeast Ohio Medical University in Rootstown, Ohio. He completed his residency training in adult psychiatry at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. He is actively involved in teaching both medical students and psychiatry students at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals of Cleveland. Um, Dr. Scheidemantel has presented locally and nationally on topics related to intellectual and developmental disability psychiatry.
Hi, my name is Nick Knickerbocker and I'm the treasurer for Psychi at Cleveland State and I will be introducing our panelists. First, we have Dr. McMahon, who is a associate professor at Cleveland State in the psychology department. She is a psychologist and a school psychologist trainer. Her research interests are applying interventions in the real world and she's also interested to see how college students manage their learning disorders, particularly attention deficit disorders. And our other panelist is Dr. Lehman, who is also an associate professor at the, and she's the director of the music therapy program at Cleveland State. She is a board certified music therapist and her research interests are the autism spectrum disorder and the, therap the therapeutic function of music. Thank you. So as um, we mentioned earlier, we do have questions for our panel that we have been determined. So um, Nick and Abby, if you guys just want to start asking uh, those, those questions. And um, for those of you in attendance, uh, any question you have to follow up with one of those questions, please do so. Do not wait till the end of the session to have a follow up uh, question. So I invite others to follow up with any of these questions. And as far as the panelists, however you guys want to tackle who wants to answer this uh, uh, is, is fine with us. Uh, so Nick, since you're already on the screen, uh, would you like to go ahead and, and ask the first question? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first question are, what are some common misconceptions about autism and intellectual disability? Panelists, do we have any preference as to who what would like to go first or tackle that? I'm good either way. <laughs> um, I guess I can give a brief answer, but I don't certainly don't want to um, take take the, all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I guess probably one common misconception uh, uh, regarding autism and intellectual disability. Um, uh, would be related to um, the uh, coexistence of, of mental health or psychiatric conditions. Um, I think a lot of times uh, delineating where uh, things that are, um, you know, typical behaviors of autism um, uh, may become more concerning or, or um, uh, interfering behaviors that could suggest a, a mental health condition uh, can be difficult uh, to tease out for, for some folks. Um, and I think sometimes they, they sometimes tend to get lumped into all of one or all of the other. You know, everything gets sort of thought of as simply behavioral issues, or everything gets pathologized into um, you know a psychiatric problem. And, and oftentimes, it's it's more of a something in the middle. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I I think you know the common misconceptions are different for intellectual disability or ID versus autism spectrum disorder. The, for intellectual disability, it's the assumption in addition um, to the fact that there might be other issues going on um, is that they can't learn anything. Um, and so that they're defined completely by their intellectual deficits and their adaptive behavior deficits. Uh, and then they're not employable, both of which are not true. I think for autism, the most common one is that it's all the same. And the, the most common phrase in the autism community is uh, that there are many autisms. And that's because it presents so differently for each individual, regardless of severity. So that I think that's the one that stands out to me in addition to, to uh, what was previously mentioned. Yeah, I, wow, I wholeheartedly agree with both of you. Um, the in, the individual, individualization of effectiveness and, and what happened and what that person is like is so um, important to understand, especially I've been a board certified music therapist in practice for almost 25 years now, and I've worked a lot with people on the autism spectrum and every single person is different. Um, and every need is different. And, um, and so some common misconceptions too, I've, I've heard is one big one for people with autism is they don't wanna be around people or they don't 
want to interact with people. They don't like people. Um, that is not true for the most part. <laughs> um, that they they just don't know, and, and they or they they interact in a different way that we have to be able to to understand. Um, to relate to. Um, and, and then another one that comes to mind, I kind of wrote down here is the intellectual ability is that um, often people with autism are just assumed to not be intelligent mm -hmm. also. And that is not true as well as even people with intellectual disabilities, they have strengths that are sometimes masked. Um, mm -hmm. But if we can harness those strengths and it, it's piggybacking off of what Dr. McMahon said, um, they're, they're definitely employable and there are a lot of things that they can do. Um, before I move on to the second question, we also have um, the two vice presidents of Psychi and Psy Beta that are here. So if they would like to do questions too, we could all like kind of take turns. Okay, cool. Okay, so the um, next question is, what is the prognosis for someone who has low impact versus high impact autism? I, I don't know that I'm, uh, I, I know a little bit about that I, since I mostly deal with adults. Um, I, I don't, I often see a sort of a, a more sort of narrow segment. Um, uh, of individuals who are on the autism spectrum. Um, my my sort of general sense, I guess, and uh, I think probably Dr. McMahon and Layman could speak to it better is um, that folks, you know, folks who have higher functioning autism without uh, a significant intellectual impairment um, can really excel at uh, a, a number of different things. It's sort of finding what, um, you know, whether it's school or employment or whatever, finding something that sort of fits their, you know, uniqueness uh, and not, you know, not trying to shoehorn someone into something that doesn't work for them. Um, but I, my, my experience is, is more limited. Yeah, I started out working primarily with children, young children and adolescents. I'm also a licensed psychologist. I have a private practice. I worked as a pediatric psychologist in hospitals uh, before coming to Cleveland State. So I, that was my primary experience. But more recently, I have been working with adults and I do teach a course in, at CSU on specifically on autism, nothing else but autism. So I, I, I would agree that the, the, it really depends on the match. It really depends on some of the other questions you have here related to the family, to schooling, to finding that um, individuality about that individual with autism and promoting that. Um, what is really interesting and intriguing now is the variety of professions, not just jobs, but professions that individuals with autism are going into. And I just read an article earlier this week about how law firms need to be more open to hiring lawyers with autism. Um, so I think the prognosis is better than it was, certainly. 20 years ago, uh, incredibly better than it was 50 years ago, but it will continue to require societal ad ad adaptation, educational adaptation and family support for individuals with autism to succeed in a variety of not only careers and jobs, but also in living arrangements too. Um, so I don't know, Deborah. Yeah, I felt I was just going to actually say that, that it, I feel like it's so individualized again, because it really depends on the environment and the support system and um, what interventions are, that person is getting and, and um, just so many different factors. I do also agree that um, I think prognosis is better nowadays. I think that society is just more open and understanding. Um, a lot better information is out there. And I think that just helps with prognosis possibilities. Okay, so I'm the, Hannah, I'm the vice president of CSU Psychi chapter. Um, so I'll just jump in and kind of branching off what you said, Dr. Lehman, um, we wanted to know how important is early intervention for individuals with autism, if you guys could speak on that. Well, I'll jump in. I, uh, I think it's critical. I think it's essential. I don't know if there's a word that we could express a higher priority or need than that. 
uh, regardless of the severity of the um, symptomology to use the medical term, but uh, of what's being expressed as part of the autism diagnosis, early intervention is key, uh, particularly for communication and social interaction, um, it, but also for family functioning and, and adaptation, which I realize that's related to a later question that you all have, but um, I, I just think it's critical. I, I completely agree. Um, I don't think that you could say anything stronger, you know, um, than, than the need for intervention early, as early as possible, that first key. And I think the key to that is, is for pediatricians and people involved with the child and the family picking up on things super quick um, and, and not letting things go, well, let's just see what happens. Um, but also being really careful to not give that diagnosis yet, um, I think is critical too. I've dealt with families before. I mean, it can be a devastating diagnosis. I think it used to be worse when I first started practicing in the late 90s than it is now. Um, but I've had families who just couldn't even bring, wrap themselves around the diagnosis. So the child has social issues and some sensory issues and language delay, but couldn't ever really bring themselves to that. So I think it's that, that mix of identifying and getting intervention right away without labeling as much as we can. I would agree. I'm not, I, uh, I, I would just sort of piggyback off of Dr. Lehman and, you know, my, yeah, my impression right now, um, you know, dealing mostly with, you know, people who are younger adults who are kind of transitioning out of childhood into the adult world. Um, you know, my observations as sort of an outsider is, yeah, the, the emphasis now seems to be much more on uh, detect the early detection, really being, you know, vigilant and, um, you know, getting, getting diagnosis early as early as you know there's you can confidently make it and getting those interventions in place because it, it really um, does make a difference i have a i have a follow-up question and um about early intervention and um just so everybody knows i, I do work with dr shago uh in, in in with individuals but um Again, I work with uh, individuals who are adults with autism and intellectual disability, but as you were talking, so I don't have this experience. So as you were talking about early intervention and you know, sometimes the use of medication and, 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 and what, what Dr. Lehman had said earlier and, and also Dr. McMahon said about um, parents being able to wrap, wrap their head around and the diagnosis and, and, and being able to accept this. Um, how responsive do you find people to be receptive to to, to psychiatric interventions when they're children. I mean, because obviously sometimes that's needed for not for the not for the intellectual disability or the autism, but for the for the coexisting maybe maybe psychological issue. How how receptive, you know? How how do you? I guess how do you approach that? It has to be so delicate, <laughs> uh, and even in 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 in. Uh, others on the panel who, who are doing psychological issues and you see that maybe there's a, a, a psychological issue here, you know, how do you approach that? How delicate? How, what's, what's your experience with that? Well, I, I, I find that the whole idea as a parent to have a child with significant issues is frightening and it also involves grief. So it, a lot of bringing up these issues related to treatment of, of the actual kind of more what um, Dr. Lehman was talking about with some of the specific symptoms, like maybe the communication impairments before there's an autism diagnosis, that kind of thing, or behavioral issue, or what Dr. Scheiderman was talking about with uh, coexisting like ADH, attention deficit disorder or something like that. Um, it's going to be a range, right? So grief is a, a multi-step process where people are often in denial that this child, this beautiful, perfect child that they had is not going to be. Um, so they have to create a new image of their child. So depending on where they are in that process, they are, uh, families are, uh, can be very open to medication. If if it's explained that this is going to help, say, with the inattention and the impulsivity, but we're going to need to do the applied behavior analysis for the communication and the, say, it's a 
three-year-old child, like uh, learning how to brush their teeth and take care of themselves so they become more independent. So I think it it's it's complex. I don't think it's there's a broad generalization except to recognize that parents are grieving. And if you recognize that as any kind of professional, then then they'll be open to the recommendation that you frame in that in that way, in that context. I love I love that you said that, Dr. McMahon, because you what you pointed on is just the importance of that you're not just treating the child, but you're treating really the whole family and that family dynamic of what is happening there and being really, I mean, there have been sessions before where honestly I my session plan went out the window and I just ended up speak talking, visiting with the family because yeah. the family just needed someone to hear that. And often they don't have supports in their family too. I had a family, I had a family once that was going through not only the grief of the diagnosis, but also they were very religious in their family. Mm -hmm. And so the grandmother of this child was convinced that the parents had sinned um, mm -hmm. and caused this autism and that she was evil. So this was, I mean, just a whole nother level that, I mean, that's a, a kind of an extreme, but it can happen. Yeah. Um, but I also find, so going back to the medication thing though, um, it, if it's explained, and I've had those discussions before where we're gonna, you know, oh, the, okay, your psychologist is looking at, at this and recommending this and the doc is look, you know, recommending this. It can help with therapies too, and, and putting those two together. So kind of, again, agreeing with you, what you said, Dr. McMahon of, um, that this is a holistic kind of approach of we're gonna use this and this and this and this and more, and let's see if it can help. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I, I think, you know, it, and, you know, certainly I, it spans the gamut in my practice, you know, parents who, have, you know, have told me, you know, we, we kind of always knew our son or daughter might need medication and they were always kind of on board with that and some who were resistant, but changed their minds later. And, you know, there's no, yeah, there's no kind of template. It's, I think it's sort of meeting the parents where they're at, if they're ready to, to make that commitment. And I think, as a psychiatrist or, you know, a potential psychologist, you know, you have to be, you have to be patient and kind of hear them out because I think, you know, you're talking about medications and those are scary and they have side effects. And, you know, if you're just come in and, and say, hi, how you doing? Good to meet you. Here's your script for medicine. It, it, it turns people off quickly. You really have to kind of put in the work to build those relationships. So. Okay, um, hello, um, I'm Sadie, um, I'm Vice President of Psi Beta. Um, kind of our next question, um, what are some like theories behind the causes of autism? I almost want to say depends on the day, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I mean, things are changing in the minute. And I actually did a little prep work and pulled an article from 2021. And it's still like, we don't know. We still mm -hmm. really don't know. We don't know. Um, I love that there are some theories that are like extreme male brain theory. And then there's the, the, the you know, the woman theory. And then there's, you know, um, when I was doing more of my work with people with autism, theory of mind was this big, was a big theory of, of that. And I still think that that is definitely part of it. Um, yeah, I, I'll turn it over to my other panelists there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, as far as, you know, what we know or what we teach or what I talk to trainees about is it's, you know, it's, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So it's something developmentally happens along the way. And, you know, it seems like there's probably lots of genes and lots of neurotransmitters involved. And, uh, you know, psychiatrically, we are, decades away, you know, more than decades away from being able to kind of pinpoint, you know, where in the brain or what, what areas or, or um, tracks or communication areas are, are affected. It's, it's, you know, it's a lot of hand waving and, you know, well, we think this and maybe that, and, um, but, you know, that's, I guess, why we're doing research to try to, you know, pin those things down. Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues. I, 
what I what we talk about in class is there are many autisms. There are likely going to be many causes identified, um, and but that's and there's just ongoing research. So that's all we can really say at this point. I think one thing we have ruled out. This probably shows my age, but um, when I first was in graduate school, we were learning about. Uh, then it was still an outdated theory, but about refrigerator mothers. Refrigerator moms. Yep. Yeah, refrigerator moms, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Which somehow it was the parenting that, that, so we know that's not it. My only point of bringing that up is we, some things have been ruled out, uh, but most, most contemporary theories are still in play. Um, mm -hmm. They just aren't always borne out by the study. So one study might show a little evidence for this, so another study for this theory of mind has been ruled out, but then it's also been ruled in. And so it's just really, it can be very confusing. Um, but I, I, I agree, it's gonna be a while before we know and we will probably know it's one or two or five things. And I, as, as you were talking, it made me um, think that also, you know, at, at the same time, we know that there's genetic, certain genetic syndromes where yeah. autism spectrum is very common Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, knowing someone has a certain genetic mutation or syndrome um, can be helpful. But again, you know, most of those things are not predictive of, you know, what the person is going to present like, you know, they may have very mild autism, they may be, you know, more high functioning, they, you know, um, like you said, it's, it's, there are many autisms and, you know, having a syndrome doesn't necessarily predict, um, you know, how, how impacted you'll be, so. Yeah. Our next question, um, based on your experiences, what types of interventions are available and how effective do they, do they tend to be? Well, in early childhood, hands down, be, uh, applied behavior analysis is the, is the most evidence, has the most evidence behind it, uh, especially when it's coupled with speech and language therapy, um, that's for early childhood. Um, most evidence-based uh, interventions do have some behavioral component to it. They don't have to all be what are considered ABA or discrete trial training as individuals with autism uh, get older. Um, there's some promising cognitive behavior therapy work with individuals with autism. Um, but yeah, again, so that's my, there, there are some things, there's some other models that are a little more broad, broad um, but they, they tend to be ecological in nature. So a combination of uh, the environment, whether that be the family, home, the school, the workplace, having some modifications to help the individual with autism adapt in that environment. So it's kind of a, you know, matching the context to the person. Um, as well as, again, addressing any co-morbid or concurrent kinds of um, psychiatric, psychological issues. That, that seems to be most effective from what I understand moving forward into late adolescence into adulthood. Yeah, and I, I should I, mention, I, oh yeah, I was gonna say, I should mention art and music therapy has a lot of promising evidence-based <laughs> research as well. So that's a Hand off to Dr. Lane. Good linen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I I'm I want to point you all to the National Clearinghouse on Autism Evidence and Practice because they do track every pretty much every year, I think. They put out a mm -hmm. report on what are the evidence-based practices for individuals with autism. Um with from the span of ages. And um, for the first time in 2020, music therapy had before then been an emerging evidence. And we are mm -hmm. now listed as an evidence-based practice within, it's called music mediated intervention. So that was really super neat to see. Um, and I know this is kind of getting to some research questions you had or you may have later, but um, our research is growing in music therapy. Um, typically using some kind of behavioral approach. So incorporating some, you know, ABA discrete trial trainings within music therapy, um, really using just music as our medium to work on the social issue, the communication. Um, social initiation has been a big one that I've worked on with, with, cli with clients. Um, and, and so it's really, you know, going back though, like you said, to Dr. McMahon, about most of what you're seeing that are evidence-based practices of interventions that do um, have proof of, of it seems to be effective, um, are 
do incorporate a lot of behavioral techniques. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, in, in the psychiatry world, um, you know, treating um, the coexisting or comorbid conditions, um, in my case, with mostly, you know, medications, um, I think, can, you know, can be quite effective. And, it, and, and oftentimes it's most effective because it, you know, allows someone to actually participate in some of the other therapies that they, you know, need to be working on. Um, so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, making sure parents or families kind of understand we're not, you know, we're not treating the core symptoms of autism. There's no medication that treats the core symptoms of autism, but, you know, we might be able to help, you know, with some of the inattention or the hyperactivity or the aggressive outburst and, and facilitate you doing the, the, the therapy. So in our case, yeah, it can be, um, it can be quite effective. Yeah, I just might, I just want to jump in and say, uh, we're talking about interventions, and that's good. However, there are many individuals with autism who don't believe they need an intervention. So I'm talking about young, uh, young adults, primarily ad adults. And I think that's interesting. One of, and one of the challenges I see in my private practice is that they maybe aren't as successful in their job, their career, their college that they would like to be, their college experience, but they don't want to change that spark, that talent, that, um, I'm trying to think of a word that I use, the kind of superpower they often feel like they have with yeah. the um, gifts that autism, being on the autism spectrum brings them. So I, I just think that's good for us to keep in mind in a traditional model, it's, we think, you know, disorder and treatment. Um, yes, of course, we want to reduce the suffering that comes from some of the core symptoms of uh, being on the spectrum. But we also want to recognize that that individuals with autism are seeing some benefits of having those. And so we want to respect that. Um, and, you know, in the world of, of what, they, what uh, has now, we use this term neurodiversity, as a neurotypical person myself, not being on the spectrum, I, I do want to res respect that. And I, so I always add that now when we talk about interventions and what works, um, we don't, we don't necessarily, we want to, we want to help people, but we also want to uh, recognize what they don't want to change. They don't have to fit our neurotypical model. Yes, I, I'm going to say amen <laughs> to that. That's a huge movement right now. Is it, it mm -hmm. talked about a lot in our field is the neurodiversity and really respecting that and going back to instead of a person with autism, the, the shift is now back to, for a lot of people they identify as being autistic mm -hmm. um, and, and recognizing that and again, as an individual choice. And so um, it's definitely focus on diversity now and honoring that and meeting meeting people where they're at. I'd um, like to ask something if that's okay um, and kind of give my thoughts. I, I, I'm a student of Professor Jordan's um, and additionally, I'm an autism mom. My, my son's gonna be 16. Um, so I have experience with a lot of this stuff. So we talk about how important early intervention is. Um, part of that, I guess, when you're presenting this to the parents, how do you explain adequately how much time and effort this takes on their part because we would spend out of seven days a week we would be in therapy six of them um, it's a full-time job managing that so how, how do you explain that these supports are critical and it's more than just giving your kid a pill right um, and additionally I want to say Art and music therapy is phenomenal for these children um, because I'm the crazy mom who bought my kid a drum set when he was a toddler after diagnosis. So when he would have horrible rage outbursts, instead of hitting himself or headbanging or whatever, I was able to successfully redirect him to go bang on the drums as hard as he wanted to. Um, so I'm just wondering how you kind of manage setting that expectation for the parents? And then how do you help them prepare for 
I don't want to say the battle with the schools, but how, how do you help them present to the schools what they can do to help support this kind of intervention as well? Um, well, I'll take the last part first so others can jump in. Um, it is a battle with the schools. I am a school psychology trainer. I also, uh, as in my private practice, attend a lot of school meetings as a parent advocate with the parent. Um, so there are a lot of school choices available now, in, especially in Ohio. I think there will be more given the increase in the diagnosis. Uh, there is a voucher program, which I won't get off on that tangent, but it does not cover the full tuition of most of those places. Um, the problem with schools, private or public, is that the services are for individuals with autism are not as intense and delivered with as much what we would call procedural integrity, meaning that doing it in an evidence-based way, it, it's not there as it should be. So, so, uh, so when parents, uh, there are people who don't, uh, who, I, if somebody can't like afford my service as a private practitioner, then I do recommend that they we have quite a few special education parent liaisons that are in Ohio and they, so I contact them or hook them up with those resources because they need support to take those battles on. That, that in and of itself is a large job, as you mentioned. Um, and then the other thing I was saying that I'll hand it off in terms of, it, there is a, I, I'm not sure how you experience as a, as a mom of a child with autism, how you experienced hearing the news, um, you, you probably had uh, mixed emotions. But what I will say is that some parents, if not many, get overwhelmed about hearing how big the, the job is gonna be. It, what, just what you're talking about, the therapies, the cost of some of those therapies and how insurance may or may not cover it the time, the effect on siblings, the effect on a marriage, all of those things. And so I, I, that has to be, I think, shared with parents over time. Um, and I think it's uh, for most parents too much to hear in the, at the point of diagnosis. And so I do think it's important that they, resources are provided and that there's follow-up uh, and that parents have someone, maybe it's not the psychologist or the psychiatrist who made the diagnosis, but someone who can help support them as their eyes become open and they become um, more aware of how much they have to deal with as a parent of a, a child with autism. So I'll hand it off to. Yeah, I, I'm just nodding all along and I'm thinking about, gosh, back, how many experiences I've had with families, so many different experiences of you know, we, they finally get into the school that they think it's going to help their child and they can't afford it. So then they have to move it out. And then they can't, who, trying to find an advocate and paying for that advocate. And um, I've seen, I've seen a family of parents that um, separated, <clears throat> um, wasn't, the child was older. She was about 10 or 11, but it was the, just the significance of dealing with this for many years um, on top of everything else. Um but I've also, so my role, I've always seen myself as walking with that, that family. So just kind of, I, as a music therapist, I'm generally not the direct like main provider. I'm usually a support provider of services. So, um, but I, but I, my role has always been to really, as I see it, listen and walk with that parent along the path and to be sometimes, you know, okay, well, have you considered this? A lot of parents don't know what the options are. So have you considered this and um, trying to link people up with services that I can't provide? I've also had discussions with families about two things. Number one, you know what? You can't be a therapist to your child 24 seven at home. So if you're not going to use the iPad Pro Loco to go to get the child to tell you what to eat for what they want to eat for dinner. Okay. It's okay. I understand because some, because it's exhausting, you know, and, um, and if they're already on a thread, Okay, you know, um, would it be better if they did? Sure, but but what's better, really, right? When we're talking about the mental health of the family, um, and the other the other thing I've seen too is having a discussion with families of that I've experienced is, you know what, I think maybe you need to take a break from 
there from me. You know, I've even had mm -hmm. one who said, you, you just, you mentioned that Catherine of, um, you know, scheduling six days a week, right? I had a family who was begging for my services in the last year or two. That was, I said, well, when do you have, well, we could squeeze you in on Saturday at 445 because the child goes to school and then she comes home like there and she's three and a half. I don't know when the child plays. When does it, when do you spend time with your child? When do, when do you just give the child a break? And so I said, you know what? Um, let's, let's talk about this just a little bit. And we decided not to go further and, and just to, you know, um, to not start services because she's in so many things and would it really add or would it detract from that? So it's complex. Yeah. I'm not sure that I have much more that I could add to that. Um, like I said, I, I tend to, to inherit families that are kind of further along in their journey who are at a different point, uh, you know, usually in the um, about to age out of school transition point. Um, so it's a, it's a different perspective that I have. Um, but I think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a great question in terms of how, you know, how our pediatric colleagues, you know, how, how do you kind of help families prepare for what's kind of ahead of them? Um, I appreciate the question. I'm not sure I can give you much better <laughs> an answer. And now we could talk about a genius parent who bought her son a drum set and how it worked. Um, okay, so the next question that we had, um, which you guys have already kind of um, touched on, is what other comorbid um, disorders do people with autism and intellectual disabilities um, experience along with those? Maybe Dr. Scheiderman can answer that first. Sure, and um, I guess from you know the, the main things that I tend to think of um, on a medical side, uh, seizures can be common. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, gastrointestinal problems uh, or, or feeding, uh, feeding or eating issues can be common in younger kids. Uh, sleep sleep disorders, um, and then on the psychiatric side. Uh, Individuals with autism experience the same, you know, sort of uh, psychiatric conditions that you know us neurotypical or neurotypical folks uh, do: uh, mood disorders and anxiety disorders, uh, and, and including psychotic disorders. Um, I think there's probably the highest uh, prevalence of anxiety type disorders, generalized anxiety, uh, social phobia, obsessive compulsive um, disorders. Um, those probably rank among some of the highest that I encounter or, or kind of uh, am called on to treat. Um, but I think anything within that spectrum, I guess I'm probably leaving out like ADHD and, and uh, things that are um, things that are often, you know, I guess my, my final words would be, there are a lot of things that um, uh, individuals with autism, you know, behavior wise, a lot of things can look like other conditions. You know, hyperactivity can be seen in autism, doesn't necessarily make it ADHD. Um, you know, there could be anxiety. There may or may not be an anxiety disorder. You know, the, the, the repetitive and restrictive behaviors, you know, whether or not that rises to the level of a, uh, of a uh, diagnosable psychiatric condition, you know, those are kind of the finer, delineations. Um, so I think that's, that's where often it becomes challenging is knowing sort of, you know, how much of this is just, this is who this person is, and this is what they feel comfortable in, uh, versus, you know, this is, you know, uh, a, a truly a, a problem. I, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Yeah, me either. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yep. Hi, um, I actually have a question. Um, so I am, uh, my name is Katie, but I'm a Professor Jordan student at LC. And um, thank you, uh, just first off, for like hosting this conference and gaining a lot of knowledge from being here. Um, so basically, like my question actually goes back to your discussion on intervention. Um, and I'm just sort of curious from like uh, those on the panel, like your perspectives uh, with clients who you've worked with. Uh, who have been on the autism spectrum, but when it comes to the age of 
um, when they receive the intervention. Um, how often do you see like mixed agents? Because I know you touched on like how you've seen um, in some cases where like family isn't as supportive. So maybe they don't get that care um, that they need very early on. Um, and they may have to like find the um, support, you know, like outside of the family system. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, how often do you get people with autism who don't actually get that intervention until like maybe in their like late teens or early 20s, um, you know, and they're like seeking it out just like on their own. Um, just kind of curious about that because I know like intervention is so important, but for those people who like don't have access to it like super early on because of limiting circumstances. Uh, yeah. Well, I would say uh, to balance out my previous negative comment about schools is that schools uh, make up a lot, make up a lot uh, for that. So they will catch some of those things um, okay. if somebody's school aged, uh, meaning uh, end of high school and usually get someone on an end a student on an individualized education plan. So it may be more school-based type of uh, educational therapy, but it's that's behavioral communicative that, is it always evidence-based? No, but that catches some. Okay. Um, I, I would say the one of the big, and the others can speak to this, one of the big gaps that happens, I think we're much better, certainly in Ohio, uh, but mm -hmm. I think also nationally at getting the early intervention, it's free that, you know, we're getting, okay you know, that we have child fine, which is federal law that we have to, we're responsible, those of us who, not me, but those like my students who are school psychologists go and find kids with disabilities and get okay. them the services. So I think that catches a lot of that. And it's not dependent on a family. Um, I mean, they have to provide permission, but it's not dependent on their income or their willingness to even uh, join in. At least there would be some therapy that would be happening with the child. Okay. What I see now is there's a huge gap, and this has been around for a while, for individuals with autism who are not, who, who, who have fairly typical, or they don't meet the criteria for an intellectual disability as well. The transition services from high school and beyond are pretty poor. And so okay. they get lost. And then they end up unemployed. Then mm -hmm. their mental illness or other mental health issues that are going on, they get they either develop new ones or they that gets exacerbated. So I think that that's like the age that I'm seeing, but that also matches what we see in the research that that sometimes those high school transition services or high school to adult are I don't know if it's because of uh, budget cuts in states or people aren't following through. I don't know the reason why, but so so that's an issue. Yeah. Uh, sure. It's a big issue, and that's also why you why we see we're certainly in the news have been very familiar of what's happening with uh, individuals with mental illness and their interactions with police. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you'll notice in the last five or six years, a lot of those individuals have um, been individuals with autism. Oh sure, yeah. So that's um, it's just something to consider that kind of reinforces that gap. And I'll pass yeah. On. Yeah, um, actually, like I do just have a follow up question to what mm -hmm. you had uh, stated, but with um, as far as like individual education plans, um, I know you said that like the parents do have to give permission, but mm -hmm. maybe they won't be as like involved in it. Like, how do you navigate that if it's like a child who has autism in the school, like school psychologist or whoever like picks up on it, but the parents like don't want to acknowledge mm -hmm. it. Like, what do you, what do you do in that sense? Well, those are not good choices. So you continue, yeah. the best practice yeah, would be to, right. So, yeah, I, don't, I know you know, cause you're asking that, but the best practice is to continue to try to engage that family. Okay. The, uh, when a student is not on an IEP an individualized education plan and their behavior mm -hmm. is an issue and their learning is an issue, then they are subject to the kinds of uh, uh, consequences in schools that mm -hmm. happen to anyone who's not on IEP. They can be uh, retained, mm -hmm. they can be expelled. Yeah, There's no, okay. you know, if their behavior and many individuals on the autism spectrum have very severe behaviors 
uh, that are um, not only inward but outward facing, and they can be expelled if they don't have that protection of the IEP. Um, okay. So that's one thing. Um, yeah. Then they also, if if the child is in danger and somehow the school, the school psychologist can also report to Child and Family Services as a, okay. uh, it's a form, okay. it, it, depending on the case, it depends mm -hmm. on the situation, it can be a form of neglect. Okay, but it can be like navigated in a way mm -hmm. um, as an alternative if the parents aren't open to working with the school. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't, okay. I don't know numbers on this. I just don't think there are too many oh, families okay. that, yeah, I don't okay. think too many families fit in that category because quite frankly, I think yeah. as Catherine said earlier, families are feeling the brunt of it. They are struggling with mm -hmm. the, the, their child at home too. So I, I don't okay. think there are a ton of cases like that. Yeah. But there are actions, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much sure. for your time. <laughs> I, I had a question also. Um, is there a point in time, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Ashley. I'm also one of Professor Jordan's students. Um, but is there a point in time in which you have ever felt or feel that perhaps it would benefit the family for maybe the parent to dabble in some of their own therapy just to help them cope, uh, their own coping mechanisms, as well as um, maybe how to react or be proactive instead of reactive. Um, and it's maybe just something, you know, because that would separate the child's uh, therapy or assistance or help um, from the parents who I could see it being very different, very different needs. I will say that uh, uh, a therapist is the number one thing on our wish list in our clinic right now <laughs> to, um, to help not only our clients, but our, our families. Um, I, I think in some cases it, it, it is just something that should be pursued and probably gets kind of pushed aside because the, you know, the, the, the person with autism or the child that be kind of becomes the focal center and, and, you know, everyone sort of rallies around to support this individual, but neglecting their own sort of, um, you know, well-being. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge thing. And, and so it's certainly something I wish we had, you know, did better or did more of, so. Yeah, there are many school programs that are um, especially private, but also the positive education program, which is mostly public funded for more severe uh, cases of autism. Uh, out, I'm blanking on the name. They have several centers, but one is targeted for um, individuals on the spectrum. So they have parent support groups. They also have parent training as part of the curriculum. And then any behavioral training that I mentioned earlier, applied behavior analysis has to have a parent component because mm -hmm. the parent has to arrange the home to, and, and Dr. Lehman was talking about this too, like using the iPads to communicate, et cetera. So any, they have to have some training on that, but the parent support group and the, the that's really critical. And that's more to the issue you were talking about, Ashley, that separating out the parent issues. And then of course, any competent ethical mental health provider is going to give uh, advice to get respite care for you, mom, mom and dad, whoever, grandparent, whoever's staying the child. So take breaks yourself uh, to uh, engage in some, perhaps some family or um, couples counseling um, to deal with some of the stress, um, that kind of thing. Dr. Lehman. I echo, yes. Um, I, you know, that's sometimes a fine line you have to walk as a provider, you know, because I'm typically, you know, providing music therapy to the child, which actually, so my, ch my children have grown <laughs> because they stay with me. You know, it is not just an acute disorder, right? Um, something that is cured and we move on. So there are always needs as the child is growing up. And so my children that I started in, in element, late elementary to early, you know, junior high, are now out of school and are in their late, you know, mid, well, mid twenties. Um, and so with that though, there's that natural dynamic of talking with parents, right? I always check in and 
every session. How's how are things going? Um, you know, I might have my plan, but and we have our treatment plan. But what is there something that we need to really talk about today? And then following up too. I mentioned that sometimes I've had to kind of scrap a plan and kind of get the kid involved in something while I'm really talking with the parent. If the parent seems to be not in crisis, but definitely not handling things well. But that's also a balance too, because then they start, you know, so I have to watch my scope of how much I go into that too. And I'm the therapist. So that's when I do start to refer out and I really start to create, you know, some boundaries that can be challenging because you have that rapport with the parent where you don't want to shut things off. Um, and certainly, you know, as a music therapist, I can provide music, you know, we could do music therapy, um, individual or group things for parents too. And that's something that, um, I've always been interested in. It just never come into, you know, the be into being, but. One thing quickly that kind of goes along with this, I wonder how much, um, of parenting style can actually be considered a benefit to the therapy, you know, of children like this, um, you know, and I guess I, I know it's a fine line, you know, you can't tell a parent, well, you have to be more communicative or you have to be, uh, you have to relax your limits or things like that. Um, but is you parenting style classes, you know, something that can be considered as, as a benefit to the, the therapies? It, typically, they're referred to as parent management training, mm -hmm. and so so that's kind of, it's getting at what you're talking about. But but if if what outcome do you want, mom and dad? Do you want fewer uh, behavior episodes, fewer screaming episodes? Then your directions need to be clear. They need to be short. You need to use a soft tone of voice. You need to th those kinds of things that happens in parent management training, absolutely, um, and it does. Uh, I, I recently had a case of a middle schooler and the parents were nonstop fighting about how to handle. Uh, and so one parent would always give in and the other parent would be too harsh. And it was like, so yeah, you spend a lot of time like, okay, what are the two things you, we want to do? What are we two things we want to see an improvement on? And we have to come to an agreement on that because it doesn't matter about the child right now because you're what you're doing is making it worse. So that's part of parent management training. There are evidence-based protocols for that, but then there also is that kind of individualized, we gotta get on the same page and let's just work on one or two behaviors that you agree on and then handle it that way. But it has a huge impact. And by the way, it also can, which it did with this middle schooler, uh, that kind of parental disagreement, um, it exacerbated some of the covert aggression and kind of, uh, I can't really get into a lot of details about the behaviors, but also then it, it also manifested anxiety. So it was interesting, more externalizing behaviors from this middle schooler, sorry about the phone. I thought somebody had that take care of, but anyway, um, and it also manifested a little more anxiety because he didn't want mom and dad to be fighting. So yeah, you have to do it. Or they have, the, you have to have some resolution to that, or it will it, it become a much more severe situation. I hate to uh, interrupt. This is uh, Professor Jordan here again, but uh, um, you know we would probably like to have you for another about five or six hours, if you don't mind. But the agreement <laughs> was <laughs> noon, uh, so um, we have time for one more question, and then um, I do know there also. Um, for the students, there's some information about Psychi that will be shared and some information about Psy Beta that will be shared. So I don't know who's asking the uh, last question from, um, from uh, Psy Beta or Psychi, but if you wanna go ahead, that way our, our panelists won't be over time too much with uh, our final question. And then we'll move into uh, a few other things. I am willing to ask the last question. Um, continuing the conversation of familial support and creating those support systems, um, we wanted to know what the best ways would be to be supportive and inclusive for family and friends who have autism. So how can um, we take away from this panel and implement that into our lives with individuals with autism directly in our lives? 
I'm going to jump in because I actually do have to log off. Um, so I, this is a uh, short answer. This is something interesting enough. I'm teaching the autism class this semester. I have 40 students in there and 32 out of the 40 have an individual on the spectrum in their family. And so, and it's been very interesting, but the short answer is you listen and you learn because there are many autisms. It doesn't matter if there are evidence-based approaches that you could talk about, you have to, you have to get to know that person in, in that family and what those parents or what those caregivers are dealing with. So listen, learn, and then be respectful of, of how they want to raise their individual with autism and how that person fits in the family. And then I apologize, I really do have to go. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, I guess I would second that. Uh, I guess my feeling is, you know, um, be patient. Uh, like uh, um, Dr. McMahon said, take time to get to know the individual, you know, be, be uh, conscientious of the fact that, um, you know, we, we tend to exist in a world made for and by neurotypical people. And um, that doesn't always work for individuals on the spectrum. And, you know, to be aware of the, the, the biases that you inevitably will bring to those uh, interactions and, you know, be cognizant of that, that you may be seeing things, you know, a certain way because of your own, um, you know, your own thoughts or beliefs or feelings and, and you know, be aware of that. and and you know, learn how to open yourself to that, so. Yeah, piggybacking on that openness. Yeah, that's what I, the, the word that comes to mind when you ask this question is diversity. And yeah, obviously such, a, such an important thing in this world right now. Um, but just, you know, everything when you think about honoring diversity, being respectful of diversity, that there are many, many people that are not like you. So again, being able to know what you're in, you know, inherent biases are and being able to um, acknowledge them and but also acknowledging that and then acknowledging the person for the person that he or she or they are um, instead of the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Um, we can't thank you enough, uh, Dr. Scheidemann, Dr. Lehman, uh, Dr. McMahon, even though she has left uh, for, for your information. I mean, uh, this was fantastic. And I also want to thank the students uh, who helped organize this and the students who attended and asked some wonderful questions. Uh, and, and, and again, it's, it's, it's too bad we can only do this for an hour, but I guess Dr. McMahon's uh, autism class is the answer if you <laughs> want to learn some more. Um, for uh, students who are uh, CSU and uh, LCC students, if you want to just uh, stick around for one more minute or so, we're just going to have a brief discussion. I know uh, students from Saikai want to just talk about uh, their organization. Uh, so uh, I will let them go ahead and talk about that because many, many of you are either at CSU or will be going to CSU. So um, uh, Nick or Hannah, if you have anything to add regarding Psychi, go right ahead. And again, thank you very much to our panelists. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Yeah, seconding that, um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming today. Um, this was really exciting working with Psy Beta to plan this. Um, we had a lot of great questions, a lot of great answers. Um, I'm actually in Dr. McMahon's um, course on autism right now. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. Um, we should get her to speak. And I love furthering um, the education on topics such as this that are so important for everyone to be more educated about. Um, so just to speak a little on Psychi itself, it is the National Honor Society for Psychology it was founded in 1929, and one of the core um, tenets of it is furthering the advancement of the science of psychology. So the requirements to be inducted as a member are that you are um, required to have at least three full semesters of um, full-time credits completed in university, and then a 3.0 minimum GPA in psychology with a cumulative GPA in the top 35% of your graduating class. So it really is an honor society. Um, we try to do a lot with the community. Unfortunately, due to the constraints of the current pandemic, this past year, we haven't been able to do much outreach, um, but we try to hold member meetings every month. 
and we really encourage everyone to apply if you're interested. Um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to um, doing more to keep educating the community and getting more engagement and learning more about all of the various topics of psychology. A uh, quick thanks, question. Thank, thank you, Hannah. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Heaven. Um, does it cost anything to join Psychi? I didn't. Yeah, so um, I forgot to write it down, but we waived our fees at least this past year for our local chapter due to the pandemic. We might be doing the same thing next semester. I'm not positive yet. Um, we're going through elections right now, but the international fees, I believe, are around $65. And if um, an applicant can't afford the fees, we are always willing to work with you and get some sort of scholarship going. Um, because especially if you're qualified and you really want to join Psychi, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to apply for the. And it's a lifetime membership. So um, yeah, if you're interested, definitely reach out to us. Again, I, the fees are under $100. I'm certain around 65, I'm pretty sure. And I believe it's a one-time fee. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, anyone else have any questions for Hannah? And to um, conclude our event today, uh, Psychi, LCC, Abby, or Sadie, whoever's there, if you want to just um, tell folks again what Psychi is uh, worth joining, just like um, I'm sorry, Psi Beta is, is is worth joining, just like Psychi. Go right ahead. Okay, um, I can plug for Psi Beta. So um, <laughs> um, we basically do the exact same thing that Psychi does, but we're, our um, organization is for um, community colleges. So everybody that's at LC and going to be there um, like the in the following um, year can join. Um, we will be doing um, another round of inductions in the fall. Um, but our thing is kind of the same. We do have local fees and then Psi Beta has a, a membership fee that's also lifetime as well. I don't really remember what it is, but it's around the same as what Hannah said for Psi Um Yeah, but we do, we tried to do like social things last year before the pandemic um, and we do community outreach as well. Um, but like, yeah, like she said, we couldn't really do too much because of COVID, but yep, we're an honor society for psychology as well. And we'd love to have everybody that can join apply. We have pretty much the same um, qualifications needed for like membership, but yeah, definitely would recommend. And if you are an LCC student thinking, which one should I join? The answer is both. So that's, that's the simple answer. Um, unless anyone has any questions, uh, that will conclude our um, panel for today. Again, uh, it was really great to see everybody here, and thank you again for the questions. And it was a wonderful working with Cleveland State. Uh, we hope to do this again next year. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, that's, that will make that happen. So thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful, wonderful day.